what I thought I would do today is I would score this 60 second trailer for, for you, in front of you. Now, I've never actually written music in front of people before. It's for me, it's a really private and personal endeavor. But, you know, I just want to show you what I do. And if you can pick some stuff out of that that'll help you, that'll be great. But let's just talk, before I start doing that, let's just talk about it for a couple of minutes. Now, some of you are using a notation program. So what you're going to do before you score the film, anybody venture a guess what you're going to make? A score? Uh, well, before you do that even. The, the notes we did for the Spot, first song. Right, spotting, spotting notes. Very good, Sam. And you're going to map out on a piece of paper, a spreadsheet. You can write it out. I don't care. You know, with uh, cursive. You're going to make your spotting notes, and that's going to be a roadmap. Now, for those of you that are using notation, I started showing you last week how you can set up your notation, right? So what you can do is one of two things. If you have, if you use Sibelius, you can put in your markers on the score. And if you're using a notation program that doesn't have anything like that, you can print, you'll have, you can print out, I, I, I'm going to give you tempos to write to. There are two tempos that we're going to choose from. So I'm going to make this, I'm going to make some choices for you. Two tempos work in different ways for this piece. And we'll, we'll discuss that before I start playing what I've written. So I'm going to give you the tempos and you'll pick that one. And this way, you're going to keep one tempo from the beginning to the end. And then you'll, you'll do that thing I did last, uh, two weeks ago, where I had the um, single percussion line with just no slashes and where things happen on the timeline. And you'll, you could print that out and you'll have it right there and you can write your score and refer back to that as to when things will happen. Now in Sibelius, you can import a movie and have it play along. If I have time at the end of the class, I'll show you how to do that, but you can just look that up online. It's not that difficult. There's an import. You can also do that in Dorito too. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And so let's take a look at what we've got here. Let me just get my screen ready. All right. Let me just. Uh... So, in my project folder, I've got my Finding Vincent master folder. Inside of that, I have my Pro Tools session. And I've got my movie inside the master folder. Now, what I typically do, command I for information and or the inspector, and it brings up everything about this movie. The format, it's only 1280 by 720, so it's not high, it's not high um, high resolution, but it's perfectly fine for what we have to use. 24 frames per second. And then there's a bunch of other stuff. It's 45 megabytes in size. And this is the data rate, 5.72 megabits per second. And this is the size, 1280 by 720. HD is uh, 1920 by 1080. And 4K is twice that. So this right here tells you it's 24 frames per second. I don't have a two, two seconds up front, which most films will have with a sync tone called a two pop. I have it starting on the first frame of action. I've found in the past that having that two seconds up front causes more problems for the students than benefits. So I've decided that to just chop that off and it starts from the beginning. And right here I've got this little box, not Ken, but anybody else remember what this is called? Simti. Yes, but what's the actual term for that box? It's four letters. Bitsy, burnt in time code. So if a director says, do you want BITC? You'll know what they're talking about. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. 
So I'm just going to play it right here. There's no sound on this at all. Now, this was a film, I'd like to say three years ago, two or three years ago, this film was in the movie theater. And it's based, it's this amazing film. Uh, it's called Finding Vincent. And it's about a guy who's got a letter for Vincent Van Gogh that he's trying to deliver to him. And it's towards the end of Van Gogh's life. And he's searching for him. And the whole thing, every frame of this movie was drawn. <laughs> so think about that, right? There's 24 frames that have to be drawn in every second. And they're all drawn in the style of Van Gogh because they're looking for Vincent Van Gogh. And if you ever get a chance to see this movie, it's, it's, it's incredible. And the score is amazing as well. I, I forget who wrote the score. But it's really great. So let's take a quick look at this. All right. So what's nice about this is that you'll have uh, something for your portfolio at the end of the day. Now, there's no dialogue on this, so have at it. You don't have to worry about writing music that fits in with a dialogue because there is none. So that's one, another reason why I'm, I picked this one. The other films all have dialogue to them the ones that you'll be doing for the final. All right. Now I'm going to play it again. And I'm going to just, I'm going to play it two more times. And I'm going to talk through a couple of salient features as I play it the first time. And then the second time through, I want you to take a look and see if you can pick out how this is structured. Okay, so the beginning, right? Motion, got train, somebody's on a train trip. More train trip, train again at night. Now this, we're, we're walking, right? And this guy here is looking for Van Gogh, this guy here. I'm just telling you that. And then now we're black and white, and that is Van Gogh's hand. All right. First time you see Van Gogh's face. See a little bit more of him. And now this is Van Gogh from the back with the full reveal. And then it turns into color. And then the fade out. I'll play it one more time because it's the first time you guys have seen this probably. <clears throat> and see if you can tell me, like discuss with me what you think the structure of it is.
Yes, Mark, this is from the trailer. This is this is the trailer. Um Yeah, I took I, I I got I got this copy somewhere, I forget, and I took everything off, all the audio off of it, and I put the Simpty in. Okay. So, oh, you can't see it, Robert Roberto? Can everyone see that? No, no, no. I was able to see it after. I, I watched the movie actually. It's beautiful. Yeah, I, D Daniel, I sent you an email back that I did um, put a folder for the today's assignment yesterday, I think. Okay. Um, I don't see the email, but I, it's okay. I just added it in right now. Okay, great. All right. So anyone want to discuss how that's structured? It seems like all the, the first part, which is the part colored, is like kind of to understand the context of the place. And then when it goes black and white, it goes deep into the intimate part of, you know, what's the scene, the Van Gogh part. And then it goes back to color at the end. Okay. Anyone else? It definitely like starts out kind of like calm, and like soft kind of, and then gets a little more intense as it progresses, which is kind of standard for trailers, but you know, towards the middle and it gets like intense versus the beginning, which is a little calmer and like prettier, I guess. Okay. Anyone else? Like there's a lot of textures that the, the piece is going through, especially like when you see the smoke, there's almost kind of like this theme of the smoke coming from the train. And then you see the smoke when he blows it out a little bit at the end, almost. And then also just the, the style that he, uh, the style of, of work that's very much impressionistic, very much um, almost like smoke. So I just feel like texture is going to be a really big, following the textures is, is going to yeah, be- Yeah, I, I actually didn't notice the smoke like that. That's good. Yeah. And thank you, Mark, for uh, correcting the name. I have like Halfheimers with uh, remembering the names of things. What's your name again? No, seriously. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. So from my perspective- there's different levels of form. Have any of you studied Shankarian analysis? Oh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no. So there's background, you know, middle ground and foreground. So there's three different levels. The background is the big picture, and then the foreground is the the, the minutia, right? The the stuff. And I actually studied with Carl Schachter for a year, who is Mr. Um, Mr. Shanker, he taught at Queens College for, and at Manus for decades. I mean, I, he, yeah, I, I think he's still with us too. Um, so on the background level, there's two sections to this film, right? There's pre-Vincent and post-Vincent. So the whole beginning is the guy tasked with bringing him the letter it's and the way it unfolds is right and the, well let's so that's the background and then the second half is showing more and more of Vincent till the end it's simple right you can just look at it that way and then you can get like into a little bit more detail where the, you could see the train from a field then on an overpass, then the train at night, and then, you know, so you can get into that detail, and then you can take the part with Vincent where you start off seeing tiny bits of him, right? His hand, then him in the distance, then him in the fields, then you get a glimpse of his face for just a second, then you're in the cafe or the public house or wherever he is, and you see more of him, and more of him is revealed until you get to the end where it's he's the only person in the screen from the back and he twists around and it gets back into color. So that's much, much, much more detail. The question is, how much of that detail do you need to catch when you're scoring a film? So, one thing you could think of is 
that music has to flow in a certain way. And if you're trying to catch every tiny little bit of action on the screen, it's going to almost be cartoonish. And there is a term for that. Anybody know? Have any guess? It's called Mighty Mousing, the film. Mighty Mouse was a black and white cartoon starring a tiny little mouse who was like a superhero. And the entire thing was like an opera, right? And um, I barely remember watching it. But what I do know is that every little thing is caught by the music. You know, if he was to scratch his head, that would be caught by the music. And any, any tiny little thing, because there was music throughout the whole uh, cartoon as I remember it. So there's actually a term called mighty mousing. You, you, my thing is that unless it's called for specifically, you just sort of want to avoid that. It really, it's, it's too herky-jerky. It starts and stops. And, and, and what you want to do with a film like this, I think, is have build, build it up and have an arc to it. And I think an arc structure is, and interwoven arcs is a little bit more appropriate for something like this. All right. This is the Pro Tools session that I've set up. But before I show you the music, which I've just muted, and how I've set that up, I imported the film. And the film's here at the bottom. And I've set it up. Now, you don't have to do this. In Pro Tools, you can have Measure 1 start anywhere on the timeline. So I did leave a little bit of space before Measure 1 in the timeline. And I have a reason for that, which I will get to before I start playing you the music. But I like to have a little bit of space. I don't want to have, for me personally, you don't have to do this, but I don't want to have it so that the first beat starts right at the very beginning of the timeline. I want to have a little space. So I put two seconds of pre-roll, and then bar one starts right here. And then that's my one hour in Simpty. So I opened up my session, and I did my session setup to help with that. So the session starts at two seconds before one hour, and the time call rate is 24 frames per second. Now, I then changed my time base to be time code and I put in my markers. And, and notice, I don't have a lot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Not a lot, right? I didn't get, and, and some of these I might not even bother with, but they're up there. Does anybody remember why I'm using the time base to put my markers in? I, we went over this a couple of weeks ago. If you change tempo, nothing moves? Correct. That the markers stay in the same place no matter what the tempo is. And in Pro Tools, and you'll have to see how to do this on your DAW. And if you're using a... Um, I'm going to be giving you tempos to choose. So you'll choose your tempo, and then you'll, you can put your markers in. I didn't know what the tempos were before I started set this up. So that's why when you look here at my marker or memory location, my reference here is absolute. It's not bar and beat. It's absolute. So you'll have to figure out in, if you're going to, you know, for the final project, I'm not going to tell you what tempo to write at. So you'll have to figure out what the, uh, how, how to put that into your session or your score. <laughs> okay. 
Now, I typically have this on the second screen. It's great. I can have it. I have a very large second screen. It's actually bigger than my work screen. So I can watch to get a better idea of the sense of it and it leaves my workspace clean. You can resize these movies, right? If I right click on this, I can make it tiny. I can make it. I can make it the actual size. I could fill the screen, right? It's got full quality. Well, some of these things don't really do much. So that's full screen, quarter size, and then you can hover here and click and drag this out and resize it however you want. So I'm just going to leave this up here, okay? One thing I like about Logic is that in the channel strip area, you can have the music in a little box and above the channel strip area over in this part of the screen. Is that correct, Mark? You mean the movie? Yeah. yeah it shows up on the upper left, left like that. Yeah, but it's actually in inside the set. It's not floating like this screen. Yeah, that's right. You can have it a couple of different ways, but it, it, it does nest into the... Uh, yeah, so like with Pro Tools, you can't do that. And that's, that's, that's a feature in Logic I like because then it would be just part of the session and it wouldn't be covering any of the controls. All right. So the two tempos that I'm going to let you choose are... 74 beats per minute, which is what I'm going to do. And I think the other one is 89 beats per minute. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the click track play during record. And I'm going to make this a little bigger so you could see it. And I want you to see, because we're going to be writing to a click track, how this works. And take a look at the feel of, and I'm going to change the tempo, and we'll see how that changes the feel. Can you hear the click? Yeah. Okay, one more time. Oh. Here we go. So you could see that there are many things that hit with a click track, right? In that. And the way that I did that was I just played around with the tempo. I tried 70. I tried 72. I tried 74. I'm going to stay in this ballpark. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to speed that up one beat a minute. And it'll make it sound more, it'll make it feel a little edgier because the click will anticipate instead of react. And I, I brought this up last week. Right, a little ahead of it. Right, a little ahead of it. Right? It's anticipating the changes. It's very subtle. Let me make it a little bit more exaggerated. I'll go up to 77, and maybe that'll help. For me, I can really feel that the music would be, is, is, it's a little edgier, 
And I don't want to get that for this, personally speaking. Right? See that? How much further ahead of it it was? Right? Much further ahead there. Right? It's off there. Ahead of that. off there and that's an important screen shot so you could see how that tempo is really doesn't really work as well as 74 now the other tempo i believe is 89 beats a minute let's see how that looks See how that works? Different feel, right? See, that's right on there. And that is two. Two, three, four, three. Two, 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 two. So either 74 or 89 beats per minute. Your choice. Can we choose both? <laughs> if you want to do two two versions. <laughs> Can you say it again? 74, huh? 90? Uh, I'm putting it in the uh, chat. Oh. Thank you. All right. 74 or 89. There, You know, it's funny. I told you about the clicks, the Hollywood clicks, um, click track. Uh, th there's actually an entire book that was made, and I think it's Knudsen's, it's called, and it's it's got every variation, and it was the Bible of Hollywood composers for decades to figure out timings. And then in the 80s or 90s, I can't remember when exactly, there was a, a software that I believe only ran on an Amiga computer called uh, Oracle, A-U-R-I-C-L-E. And that was sort of like a calculator that composers used to map out their whole film score. And But now all the DAWs have, like I said, built-in calculators, so it really is helpful. Yeah, it's funny, Mark. In the 1980s, when I was going to buy a computer, I was... Um, looking at the Amiga over the uh, uh, the Mac, and then I decided not to get a computer at all, and then the Amiga went belly up, so I felt very nice, very fortunate to not have wasted my money buying one. Instead, I wasted my money buying a Macintosh. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, all right. Any questions on that? Right? You could see how like just a beat or two per minute can really make a difference in the feel or how well your score lines up. So you just basically you just experimented until they right. lined up? Yep. Mm -hmm. How did you map that out? I'm not quite sure what you what you mean by that, Mark. Well, so you, you did you put markers in for each of those uh, transitions? No, no. Pieces? Oh, well, I put my markers in first before I did the tempo. And then I watched, and I, I thought, I, I first I had it at the a faster tempo, and I was like 90, 91, and I was watching it. I thought, it's too fast. It's things are, things are hitting a little bit too early. And then I just slowed it down. What I wanted to do with this was I wanted to just give you one tempo that would work, right? I definitely changed tempos 
to make things hit differently as a piece unfolds. I, I change tempos all the time, but I wanted to make this as, I wanted to take some decision making away from you so that you could focus in on writing the music. Right, and if it's at one tempo, I think that that's a little bit easier for everybody to just, with the first time that they may be writing music for picture, rather than always trying to figure out how to change the tempo to hit something, and then hitting, then making the music all flow when you're changing tempo, it, it just gets to be more complicated. And I wanted to try to take some decision making away and simplify the process as much as possible. So. I, I got that faster tempo, and then I thought, you know, what if I wanted something that was a little bit slower? So then I, tr I played around in the 70s, and I found that the 74 was the, the tempo, tempo that worked at that, at that um, little bit slower pace. I'm sure I could experiment around and find something in the hundreds that works. Now, one thing to think about when you're writing the music, right? So let's say you pick 74 beats per minute. Writing at that tempo gives you more rhythmic flexibility. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're writing at a really fast tempo, you're going to be stuck into eighth notes, and you know, like if if you write for for your stuff. If you're writing at a little bit slower, you can put sixteenth notes in there. It won't sound too rushed. It won't sound too fast. You can have eighth notes. You can have eighth note triplets. It gives you a little bit more flexibility because there's more space between each beat, right? So at the beginning, like if there's a train going, if I'm at like 120 or something like that, tick it, tick it, tick it, tick it. If I'm at 74, tick it, 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 right? I can make a train. I've got more flexibility at a slower tempo um, in terms of the rhythmic values that I can write. I don't do that here, but that's just a thought I wanted to throw out there when you're deciding to pick your rhythm, your tempo. And if you're at a slower tempo, it's a little bit easier easier to write like a little ethereal music as well, right? So, okay, I'm going to hide the movie for a second. And I've got my session set up here. So I've got, now let me just show you something here. And you see how this works on your DAW. Over here in the, let me make this really big so that it's easier for you to see. In Pro Tools, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure about the other DAWs, I can choose how I view the film. And this is a place where you can save CPU power. So I can look at this as a big block, right? or I can look at it as frames. And as I zoom in, right, it shows me more of the frames in the timeline. Oh, please show up. Don't, don't make a, a mockery of me. There we go. But you see how it takes time for it to draw in? So, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that is useful. Not for me, though. I, I just make it blocks. And then over here, you have your output settings. This is not an HD film. It's, it's only 24 frames per second. It's not 60 frames per second. So I can do it at full quality, but you can do draft and best performance. So if I might, um, if I'm working with 120 instrument tracks, and I've got a four, like an, an HD or a 4K film that I'm scoring, I might put it on best performance or draft, and then that will use less CPU. So let me just show you. I don't know if you'll be able to tell that much here. You see now that this has gotten blurry. I don't know if you could tell. And if I put it here, the image is sharper. So it sort of reduces the uh, resolution of the image you're seeing which means it less, needs less CPU power to, to view it. Now, I've decided that I want to do a light orchestral piece for this, right? 
So, and I want the piece to be, so, so that for me leaves out instruments that I don't need. And I'll go over that in a second. So what I've done here, and I just started using these because they're just be recent version of Pro Tools, but they're in every other DAW from what I, I know, is I've got everything set up. I've got my winds, my brass, pitched percussion, regular percussion, long strings, short strings, and effects strings. And I also, in the long strings, I've got a choir patch. And remember last, when I discussed some of my scores, I like to use ensemble patches for big gestures and then for detail, put in solo patches. And I told you the reasons why I like to do that and I'll go over them again. Ensemble patches sound different when you're playing them than the individual instruments. So let's say I take a flute, an oboe, an English horn, a clarinet, and a bassoon, and I write a passage for that using four individual instruments. If I want to do a unison line, that's going to sound a certain way. It will sound more authentic, right? If you're playing, if all those people are playing that note at the same time. Because that's what actually happens. The room resonates in a different way. And it captures a more authentic sound. You have to be careful to not make chords that are too thick because it, all the instruments multiply. So in other words, if you have an ensemble patch, a woodwind ensemble that has on unison, flute, oboe, clarinet on each note, so each note you play has three players on it. If you're playing two notes, each note that you play has three players on it. Three times two is six. So that sounds like six. You add a third note, it sounds like nine players. And you could see that you just have to be careful with that. It, it does, it, you know, especially with strings, string writing, if you've got 12, 24 players in a string ensemble and you play two, a two-note chord, you got 48. That's really can get very muddy and very diffuse. The sound isn't really uh, as crisp as it can be. So I've got this organized in a way, as I've said before, where I've got all my instruments sort of like you'd see it in a score, sort of. I like to go from high pitch to low pitch, but I also do something else. So let me open this up. These are all in what are called track folders. And I can open the folder up and you could see that I've got all these instruments here. I mean, uh, this doesn't have to be that big. So I've got a legato flute. Huh. Why is that not sounding? Interesting. Maybe it's the octave? No, I'm clicking on the keyboard no. where it's white. Oh. Um, interesting is your, is your VCA up uh, oh you know why it's not sounding I know why it's not sounding I'm an idiot I got the music output uh, muted because I didn't want the music that I've written I wrote, a, I wrote the first 10 seconds so that I'd at least have something to start with so I had that muted and I unmuted it Interesting. Okay, let's do this. I'm going to close this session and I'm going to reboot. Stuff happens, man. It's live. Live TV. I could tell you stories about Broadway and weird things happening. Guy's teeth fall, like an, uh, an older gentleman's teeth falling out on stage. People coming out with their flies open. 
like you know stuff like that people going up on their lines so there's this uh, when I was playing at the original Little Shop of Horrors the uh, the actor and he was such a great guy amazing person Fivish Finkel he played Mushnik and he used to forget his lines occasionally and he would improvise something so one day in the second act, he forgot his lines and he just started talking in gibberish like that at the same rhythm and pitch as his lines. And the very next line Seymour said is, what's that supposed to mean? And, you know, I mean, it sounds stupid, but we were all, uh, we were all in hysterics because it, it was just very funny. This will take a minute to load in. Did you ever work with uh, Walter Sear in uh, any Broadway gigs? I know, didn't he play tuba in the Ice Capades or something? Uh, actually, Ken was good friends. Uh, Ken that's watching this thing was good friends and worked and engineered many a session at Sear Sound. You know that Walter, oh, cool. Sear, Walter Sear was actually uh, a salesman for Moog synthesizers in the early late 60s and early 70s. And he did the same thing for the ARP 2500 too. Yeah, I only did a couple of sessions at his at his studio. Hey, Pete, he was also a great theremin player in the day and did a lot of film scores. So does everybody know what a theremin is? Right, it's an instrument invented by Leon Theremin, I think his name was, or Leo, Leon. And yeah, it's yeah, great. You, you put your hand in between these metal things and you use it to change the pitch, the electrical fields and all the stuff. Star Trek, yes, exactly. I can honestly say I've never touched one. Me neither, but um, I've there's a, a woman, Elizabeth Brown. She lives in Brooklyn. She's a fantastic flutist and composer, and she plays in a group called the Flute Force. And I my, we went to see a performance that she did at at Baruch College, and. Um, she wrote a piece for uh, three fl three flutes or three flutists, and they played different instruments. And everybody was in different. Like in other words, one person played in this piece bass flute, alto flute, and piccolo, and another person was just regular flute and piccolo. And and then another person had uh, like uh, one of those flutes you had to stand up. And and she played theremin on the stage, and the other members of the group were all around. It was really amazing. She did a great job with that. Okay, let's see if we're, we're going here. Okay, great. Great, so we have sound. I'll be cutting this out of the video that I post up online. So, okay, so we've got our flute, just legato solo flute, a short flute, a legato oboe. Is that loud enough for you guys? It could be a little louder. Okay, let me do this. And then short oboe. And then, so I've got a few solo instruments, right? Just the wind quartet. I'm not even sure I'm going to use them. But then I've got ensemble patches. So I've got short winds. That's low, and then I've got high short winds. I've got long high winds. See, like... You hear how that sounds? And let me do this. Right, so I'm playing those four instruments, the solo instruments together. It doesn't quite have the same sound as playing a well-balanced ensemble patch. So, and then I've got a VCA, and I think I went over what that did, and I just use that for separating out the sections and to control, and I can solo everything, and I can do, it has an additional layer of volume mixing. 
and then I've got my brass. And I don't have a lot of brass instruments. Give me one second. Let me close this file folder, and I can make my brass a little bit bigger. So I've just got a legato horn. A soft horn, long, oh, not some solo. And then I've got four horns long, and four horns short. I'm not even sure I'm going to use that tuba. And then I've got an ensemble low brass. And the reason I have this particular sound is that, let me just set this up a little better. At th that volume, it sounds like a choir almost. It's beautiful. And I might want to use that to fill out a few sections and just make it sound a little richer. And then, uh, let me close that folder. I've got my pitched percussion. I've just got this thing called, uh, I've got an acoustic piano. And then I've got a felted piano. And I've got a celeste. Now, let me show you what I did with this celeste. This is interesting. So this is from a company called CineSamples. And this was recorded at the Fox, I believe at the Fox Studio, or Sony Studios, one of the big scoring stages in Los Angeles. And let me just get it up to, to the way it came. Oops, hold on. So this is the original sound. Uh, right that's a beautiful sound I don't I don't think it would work with this piece and the reason I and that I've got a lot like a very loose concept in my mind the reason I don't think it'll work is that there's too much information and it sounds like it's right in my face and I want to have something that's a little bit dreamier so a couple of things First thing I did was I added a high pass filter and I got rid of a lot of the low end. Let me bypass that. See that how it gets rid of the that honkiness? That's going to be better. Then I I did a I could select my microphones here and balance them. So what I did was I used the room. And see how all of a sudden it's no longer right in your face. It's a little dreamier. But I wanted a little bit of definition. So I did some of the overhead mic. That's better. All right, so as I'm writing, I'm mixing. I'm thinking about how this is going to fit in to the final product. Then I've got a harp. And just to show you that you don't have to have the latest and greatest, I bought the, this is, Sonovox Symphonic Harp. I purchased the sample library original for this software called Giga Studio like in 19, maybe like in 2001. Still sounds great, right? 20 years later, it was recorded in this place called Mechanics Hall up in Worcester uh, near Boston. It was beautifully recorded in 24 bits. Uh, back then, so it still works really beautifully. And then I've got a Glock and a tube.
And then I have some percussion, not a lot. I have cymbals. Cymbal rolls, which I'll probably use. Piatis. I've got finger cymbals, which I added after I started writing, and I'm going to show you how to quickly add sounds to your palette. I'll, I'll teach you that too. And then I've got a timpani. I'm not even sure I'm going to use heavy percussion, but I have it. And then here I've got um, my long strings. These are all ensembles except for two solo instruments. So in here I also have bundled the choir. And yeah, let me just do this. So I've got this choir. And I like that, but I want it to be ethereal. And some of these things that I'm going to be teaching you and showing you today are not things that you're going to be able to do because you don't have the technology yet. But there are ways around that. But I want to show you that why it's important to learn technology. All right. So um, I have added some, I've done something here that I don't normally do. I've inserted a time-based effect into the signal chain as opposed to sending a copy of the audio through an AUX track with that time-based effect. And because this is the only instrument that's going to be using that, so I want it to be baked in as part of the sound. So I've got this thing, called, and this is not an expensive plug-in, it's called Valhalla Shimmer. So here's our choir. Now listen to what happens when I add the shimmer. Right, I'm no longer playing. Hear that? That ethereal. So what's happening there is that it's a reverb and then there's pitch shift going on at the same time for the reverb signal an octave higher. And then there's um, some chorusing going on with that. There's a, right, there's mod rate and mod depth that's doing that. And I've got that Pretty, pretty wet. It's at 70% wet. And you could play around with that. So without the Valhalla and with it. Right? So as I'm going along, I'm thinking about the final product and how I'm going to shape the sound to make that. And then I've just got solo, vi I've got violins, legato. Cello legato. And then I've just got long strings. Consordino, no articulations. Consordino. Sul ponticello. Flautando. Harmonics. Tremolos. So like I said, I'll be writing with the sections and adding detail with the soloists. And if I need more, I can add it in later. And then I've got short strings. Spiccato. Spiccato with mutes on. Pizzicato. Bartok pits. Colenio. Anybody but Daniel know what Colenio means. It would. Correct. You're bouncing the back of the bow on the strings. String players don't like doing that. It ruins their bows. But it's a great sound. Expensive, so. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Daniel. Their bows are expensive. Yeah, They're, so you know what what I would say is if if you're gonna if I was gonna hire string players and I needed a lot of 
uh, a lot of Colenio, bring your cheap bow and your good bow. And then, you know, or I would just leave the, the Colenio from the sample library in there. And then I've got a solo bass pizzicato. And then just one other food group. FX strings. And this is something that I would strong if you're as you're building up your sample libraries to do this, and you don't have to do this today or tomorrow. There's something to think about. There are things that instrumentalists can do to animate the sound that you can't really program. Especially with long notes. Long notes, a string player can play a note and they can change the timbre and the feel and they can do all sorts of stuff in real time that you just can't really program in well. So you need to capture those performances and add them in judiciously. They add a lot of life and expressivity to the music you write. So I've got these evolving patches. So this is the first one. And you see how that went from quiet to... Um... Right, that's one note. It's unfolding over time. Right, I'm not doing anything. If I were to switch the view, you'll see. You can't really program that in, you know? So it's good to have that. And I've got a second one. So they got to be used judiciously. This just needs to be colored better. Yes. Uh, professor, I have a question. Yep. Um, you might have showed that already, but would you mind like uh, showing quickly how you how you created those subfolders to each track? Yeah, I haven't taught you in uh, our, our other classes because some people only have older versions of Pro Tools, and this is in a recent version of Pro Tools. So the, the way that you do that is, let's see. Okay, I'll do that in a second, all right? Give me, uh, Rob Roberto, just give me 30 seconds and I'll get to a spot where I can make one and use it. Sure, right? thank you. So this is my folder for all my AUGS masters. So I've got all the outputs of each of my food groups routed to this one, each individual track. And this will help me when I'm mixing. And it'll also help me if I have to make stems because I can just bounce out these individual to get you know, break down my whole score into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tracks, which will, you'll, you'll need to do that sometimes. So there's another step I'd have to get to, but that's what I, and I, I can actually, instead of adding reverb onto every instrument, I can just get it all here. And let's say that the whole wind needs a little bit of high pass filter. I can add it right here instead of on each individual track. So that saves you CPU power. So having these additional tracks to route everything through is very helpful. And then at the bottom, I've got my two reverbs. So I've got a, a, a long haul, which has 3.08, right, about a three second decay. And I've got the same haul and I made it a lot shorter. And I also turned down the decay rate so that I can use the same haul and have two different perspectives. Because I'll just tell you when you're mixing sampled instruments, Short articulations don't need as much reverb as long articulations. They need shorter re reverb times. Uh, because when you play an, a, a, a short articulation, all of these instruments were recorded in a room, so you're getting the sound of that room. When a note is sustaining, you're not really hearing the, the reverb of the room, so it just seems to me that it sounds better when I'm using a longer haul and having control over that 
with my long instruments. So now if I wanted to put these two guys in their own folder, Command Shift N, one new basic folder, and I would call this FX. And um, I would take these two guys and I would drag them in here. They've got the little gold bar around the track. That means that I'm right in there and boom, they're in. And then I want to color code that. So I highlight all of them and I just match the colors up. So you first create the sub like the subtracks and then no, you, you don't put need, it no, into you don't folder? need to. No, you no, you could just take you could put sub you could put folders around any tracks. Oh, okay, I got it. All right. I have a question. Um, a couple of weeks ago, when you showed us a score, you had a couple of blank, well, not blank tracks, but you had uh, scoring tracks that weren't assigned to any instruments. Yeah, I'll sh I was just getting to that. <laughs> okay, so, great. so let me just show you how when you're working, you want to set things up in advance that will save you time. So if you can save a minute here, a minute there, you know, over the course of a project, it adds up to a couple of hours maybe. And that's, and also the amount of time that you're, you have to spend doing things that you could set up in advance that takes your mind out of being creative, right? So I like to set things up in advance. So if we look in my tracks list, which is over here on the this white area over here, and I'll make this bigger. We don't see that screen? Oh, thank you. And I'll, I won't even be in the screen, so you'll see it. Okay, let me just move this out of the way on the second thing. So this is my tracks list over here. And these are all the active tracks up here. They're in regular uh, letters. Now, if I were to open up the winds track, watch what happens right in this area here. Boom. You see all your tracks, and then, boom, they're hidden, which makes it a little bit more manageable in terms of how many tracks are in that list. So if I want a new... Let's say I want a new track. I have to do Command-Shift-N, New Stereo, Instrument Track create, then I have to go here, and I have to add my con an instrument. I'm going to add contact. I have to wait. Okay, so that was about 30 or 40 seconds right there to do that, and it was a pain in the neck. Let me just delete that because I don't need it. Let's say I wanted to add another instance of contact. Show and make active. Boom, there it is took two seconds right and I keep them at the very bottom now and I've got so let me just hide and make that inactive now let's say I'm working with the, the winds uh, no let's say I'm working with my lo my long strings right now what I've done here is I've got things set up in groups and things routed. I've got things set up in groups. I've made groups over here, which will help. That's why I can add my VCAs. And I've got things routed to certain outputs, and they're all set up. These guys here don't have that done. So what if I wanted to add an extra string and have all the routing and everything there, very simple. I would highlight, let's say I wanted to add a solo violin instead of a, a ensemble violin. I would highlight the violins or any of these tracks, but I want my, I'm gonna have it up at the top. I'm gonna right click on this and I'm going to duplicate. I am not gonna duplicate the playlist or alternate playlists because I don't really want the MIDI information. I just wanna get the insert and the sends and the group assignments, right? Okay. Now I just have to name this, rename this. And then go here and just pop in a solo violin. 
Don't you want to get rid of the other instrument first? No, because I want I, I, additional, not instead of. Well, I mean the one that's already in that instance of contact. Yes, I will. Thank you. I wanted to find where the uh, solo strings were, but knowing me, I would have, I would have put in this one, and then I would have had to delete that when I changed the MIDI channel. Uh, so, and then I could just put in. Um, oh, let's see. Let's. I could put in. There we go. And I'm going to leave this in here actually, and I'm going to purge. So now this is half a gigabyte's worth of samples. I want to purge my samples, which I went over last time. And I've got all these articulations available to me. So now I've got a solo violin. This doesn't have legato, though, so it might be an issue. I'm going to leave that. All right. And notice it's color-coded correctly, right? And the output goes to the right output over here. And if I look at my, if I want to modify groups and I look at uh, my long strings, my solo violin has been added to my group. So that's how you quickly add another instrument to a group that you're working, like, like a section that you're working on. So I would have had to have manually added all those steps. I would have manually had to color code it, manually had to set the output, and manually had to add it to the group. This way, all I have to do is delete the one, rename it, delete the one instrument that's chosen, and put in the instrument I want. Much, much quicker. I have a question about the, uh, the Spitfire samples. You, uh, you had recommended the BBC uh, library? Yeah, the, the Discover. It's free for students. Yeah, yeah. What I wanted to know is, so that comes with its own player. Can that actually be loaded into contact? Do you know? No, no. I, let me just show you. No, it's its own player. It's a plugin. Right, I, I know. I'm using no, it. No, it, it, it just gets put into an insert. Right? So this is the player here. That's not contact. That's their own proprietary player. And a lot of the companies are going this route now because... They have to pay a lot of money to get the license to have it show up in the instrument area of contact. You know what I mean? And so, like, let's say I wanted to put BB, another one, if I go to Spitfire Audio, all of these are in their own player. So I would just select it here or in the instrument folder. Is there a way to purge samples in those players? Not yet, no. It's, they, they need to really do that. Yeah, that's why I was asking. Yeah, so, yes, and I, I have seen where in some, where one of the guys that, one of the two guys that started the company said that they're working on that. But it's easier said than done, you know. Uh, okay. Any questions on the setup and everything? Let's get our movie back in here. That's I had asked about the uh, the sketch tracks that you had had in that other um, project a couple weeks ago. Yeah, one more time with that, Mark. You had um, in in the a score you were showing us, um, or a session you were showing us two weeks ago. You had these four tracks which were white. They were up on top of the. Oh, oh, right. So what? Right. Okay. So what I did for that, <clears throat> right? That's for the animatic. Was after I was done. I wanted to use it as a teaching tool. So I created a sketch score of nota in notation. I'm not, I, I don't use notation when I write. I just, I write with my ears and I, I look at the MIDI thing. Occasionally I look at notation in the edit window, but I don't look at a score when I'm writing. So you're basically just playing something into a track or into an instrument as you go? Yeah, I'm improvising. Great, great, I get it. I get it. Also, what's the a shortcut to get to the uh, to see the video in Pro Tools? Like uh, it's like, Command so. and uh, yep. So let me close this. Oh, you can't see it. Let me do this. Command and this nine here. 
if you can't do, if you have a laptop and you don't have this side keyboard here, it's under window, video. All right, so I can make this a little bigger and still work. All right, let's get everything the same size and let's do this. Okay, so I started and right now going forward, unless I'm looking at you directly and changing the look, we're gonna look at me here because I want you to see what I'm doing on the keyboard, on this controller here with the mouse and what I'm playing. All right, so I think that that'll be very helpful. It's like a, I'm running a TV show here. Come on, it's the Pete show. Let's take a listen to what I've done so far. Oh, one other thing. Yes, another important thing. I forgot, almost forgot. Good thing I, it came into my head. Let me, uh, this is way too big. I don't need to see all that. Now, you'll notice this is bar one, right? You'll notice before bar one, there's a lot of data. What I did was I record enabled all the instruments and I set a softer volume so that the instruments don't come blaring in, which is why I had to turn them up a little bit for you to hear them, right? So I just recorded that in so that it starts off at a softer volume and then I can just bring it up as I need it. So I do that at the beginning of every piece. This way they're all in about the same volume area because some instruments are recorded louder than others. And it just, it just helps out to preset that. So let's take a look at what I've done so far. Okay, this is where I stopped. So how's the volume on that? Is that loud enough? Right. Okay. So it's just, I've got a harp. So I'm going to start opening these things up so we can see them. And what I've done here is... Interesting. Interesting. So this is something new with folders that I never realized. It kind of defeats my VCAs. Huh. Interesting. Oh, unless I did something bad here. Hold on a second. Ah, forgot a solo save. Okay. No matter how long you've been doing this, there's always something you mess up. So very simple, right? A little like almost like quasi Debussyan harp. And the celeste is very simple. And that's a point that I want to bring forth is that simplicity, right? I need to get somewhere. I don't want to start off with big chords on the celeste, it only needs that one note to really help the harp out. Right? Light and, and that motion, tick it, tick it, tick it, tick It's a kind of, it's a train, but it's not heavy and hitting you in the face. Right? It's not like uh, um, faster than a locomotive kind of a thing. Right? It's this impressionistic painting and a train in the countryside. On, over over a water body at night and then with that I have a choir and let's take a listen solo to the choir see how having that shimmer has this beautiful etherealness so let me just show you a couple of things that you need to learn how to do. 
I am animating the sound as it's going forth. And what I'm doing here is I'll play this. Right? And as I played, I'm using these two controls. I've got one mapped to the mod wheel, which goes through the dynamic layers, and I've got another one mapped to expression, which just controls the volume. Not the dynamics, but the volume, whether the, the sample is louder or softer, but not a softer dynamic layer. In other words, the mod wheel controls whether somebody's singing softly as opposed to taking a loud sample and playing it softer. And what they do with these samples is that they, they are, are multi-sampled so that you've got softer and different levels of volume. So you might have pianissimo, piano, mezzo piano, mezzo forte, forte, fortissimo. So you play one note and it has all, all of those programmed and you go through the different dynamic layers using the mod wheel and you supplement that with the volume. Now, I don't typically use MIDI volume to do detailed work. I use MIDI volume as uh, like a gross, like if the whole track is too loud, I bring it down with the MIDI volume. But I like to do my detail work with mod and expression. Now, not every sample library is programmed with mod to go through the different dynamic layers, and the BBC Discover Orchestra doesn't have that. They, you know, they didn't add that in. What do you want for nothing? It just has the really nice recordings of those instruments. But you can use the expression. Uh, I, I do think the mod works as terms of volume up and down, but it's not um, going through different dynamic levels. It's just playing one, one, one sample louder or softer. Now, if you don't have one of these guys, and I did this for decades, for I, literally, if I said I did this for decades, I wouldn't be kidding because I've only incorporated this over the last three or four years is you would have the pencil tool in your DAW and you would open up, this is called an edit lane in Pro Tools. So it's where you can assign all your, play around with all your controllers. So what I do here is I would just draw something in, right? I would play it in and go back afterwards and draw it in. But you got to animate, you got to automate to animate to make your stuff come to life. You know, if, you, if you're not animate, if you're not automating the, those different parameters and everything is at one volume, it gets very boring very quickly. <laughs> Nobody plays like that unless they're playing a piece by Philip Glass. Ouch. And I won't be editing that out. I won't be editing that out. I won't be editing that out. I won't be editing. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> I do like Philip Glass. I like Steve Reich much more, though. All right, so I've got that. And then I've got some pizzicato strings here. Just to give us a little, little motion. And then all that. And then one other last thing is I've got some winds just ensemble winds playing some staccato lines over here speaking of uh, Philip Glass or Stephen Reich right now let's talk about arranging everything doesn't come in right at the beginning of your piece right I'm starting off with harp then the celeste, then the choir, the bass, and then the winds. So the, 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 instrument, the instruments come in in the timeline. They unfold. They're characters in this play of music. That's sort of how I look at it. Okay, so I'm just going to start working from this point going on, unless there's any questions on anything I've done so far. And over the next, uh, we're going to go a little later today because I, I want to make sure that I get through a good portion of this with you here so you can see what I'm doing. All right, because we don't have a class next week, so we won't be around for a couple of weeks.
Oh, I've got my little finger symbols also. Just to add a little mystery, right? Just a couple, two hits with the finger symbols, right? Just... And if we listen to the harp, I mean, the celeste, the finger symbol, and the um, bass pizzicato, it's kind of interesting. Right, see how those, those guys work together? Just a little, a little something. All right, so what am I gonna do next? Let me take a look. Okay, so. I'm getting rid of this because I want this. I instead of making a big change, right? When the picture changes, the tremolo strings end because it doesn't happen on a beat. See that? And that helps me out. Okay, so let me just see if I, I don't even know if I like this next section. Okay, so there's, I don't like that. I'm editing because I want to have something different the second time. Right? I played that in and I just went about editing it. Okay, so I need something here to give me a little bit of motion and I'm going to try these string evos and see what I come up with. No, I don't like that because as I'm watching this, I want to have something restful come in on the boats, uh, uh, the dock, that right there. So, because then right after that, I believe it goes to black and white. Okay, so. Let's do this. I think I know what I want to do this. So I'm going to get rid of this virtuoso violin because I think I want to have legato. So I'm going to add that in. And that didn't have a legato um, patch in it. All right, so. Okay, so I think that I want to change that sound a little bit. So I'm making it a little colder. I'm taking the vibrato off. And I think that that'll work. So let's, and another thing I'm going to do is now that I've got something with a, a pace, I've turned off the, the metronome because I don't want to have that metronome. I've got those rhythmic things going. I'm going to play off of those rather than play into the metronome at, in this part. So let's start here.
And I'm going to overdub something. So right here, this is called MIDI merge. That means I can record more MIDI information without erasing what I've already done. And I'm going to work on the vibrato. And that last note's too loud. I mean, too long. And then I need a little bit something else in there. do that I'm gonna come in a little later so that's the prepared piano no that's a felt piano right as opposed to... so basically it's a piano that's that's got felt on the strings and the hammers hit the felt first and it adds a certain mood to it that and let's see I remember I said I, I was gonna have this brass here to have some nice warmth I think that's the chords there is it So this is too loud here, right? So I'm going to just bring the whole thing down. Right? I'm mixing as I'm working. I'm going to do something, again, that I don't normally do. I'm going to put a delay in there, and I'm just going to use the like a basic, uh, the one that comes with Pro Tools. So it's the Mod Delay 3. I won't use one of my fancy delays. And what I'm going to do is turn the feedback up a little bit, a little bit more, and I'm going to take off some of the, a lot of the high end and bring down the mix. And then I'm going to do a dotted eighth note and a quarter note. And let's hear what we got there. All right, so see, I'm mixing as I'm going along. I'm adding effects. I normally do it as a send with, with re re reverbs and delays, but that effect is just for that instrument, so I'm going to put it in there. I actually, in, I don't let my, st <laughs> I, I discourage my students from doing that because I want to get them used to routing audio to send effects, but I do add that in. Great, okay, so let me add my, Brass in here, filling out that middle section. Oh. Okay, so that went too long. And let me just, I'm going to do that one more time. Okay, I missed it. <laughs> All right, 
I don't know if I like that last chord, so let me fix that. Now, I'm not going to be quantizing something like this. Okay, great. But what I am going to do now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do my dynamics by overdubbing. So I've got MIDI merge turned on. And what I want to do is I want to add a little breath between each chord, right? Notice how I played them where the notes are overlapping. So I'm going to put my playback head there and I'm going to use command E that separates that out. And I'm just going to delete those. And I'll do the same thing here on the last 16th note, give the guys and women a chance to take a little breath. And then let's see. And let's do this here. Oop. Right. So that we leave that this beautiful scene right here in the clear for the next bit. Okay, so this is bothering me here. What I want to do is make this shorter and make this last note longer. Right, and I want to get a, like a, a gliss so I can change the velocity there and you'll hear what I mean. I need to have this overlap a little bit more. And then with this one also, I want this, like they have the intervals between programmed in, all right? Now, there's a little bit of activity going on with the guy there. Um, he's a little bit drunk and he's talking to the police officer, I guess it is. I've noted that. I might come back later and play around with that. Like this right here. Or I might try to do something there now. Yeah, I was going to ask about that little, that little action there. Yeah. You know, it's like you could think of it in terms of you got a big piece of wet clay on a wheel. And the first half an hour, you're just making a general shape. And then you get through the whole thing, and then you go back, and you fine-tune, and you keep fine-tuning. So that's that's definitely a way to work, and that is how I work. So, you know, I use something like that. Right, you could see that it just adds a couple of notes will add. So So these are kind of cool chords. Uh, I could, you know, show you some of my harmonic concept. It's basically I do a lot of things called intervallic harmony, like like the stuff that um, David Berkman teaches you in the harmony class. It's fantastic. Uh, it's great, you know, learning how to do all your like extended jazz harmonies, or if you've taken undergraduate courses and you've learned your four part Bach chorales and you've studied harmony that way. That's great, but I sort of look at putting different kinds of intervals together so and using fragments of chords. So this is basically a C major seventh without the E. And that's a, a, like, you know, a, some sort of D chord without the third. And then just moving voices around. So anyway.
clean that up. So I don't need these. Delete those. I'm not going to quantize this. So I'm going to leave that in for now, but what I am going to do is I'm going to change the dynamics. I'm going to leave the timing the way it is, and I'm going to do a crescendo. So very simply, I'm going to play around with the velocity using the pencil. Now, the pencil has different shapes, freehand, line, and when I teach this in my classes, I tell them to use a line at first, right, And because it's easier. See what happens if I uh, this area here. It's I'm a little behind the beat, which is unusual. Let me just quantize it a little bit, not completely. Oops. So I'm going to leave that hit on the picture change for now. I may get rid of that, but I'm just leaving that there. And right here, I want. Let's see. What do I have here? Right, so I've got just like two and a half beats. So let's go to our string effects and see what we've got. Hmm. Right, so let me come in a little bit early. I need to come in earlier with that, and I'm going to do dynamic work. Nope. Now, interesting, right? Let me fix this up a little bit. Now, I could have something new start right here, and that's the obvious place, or I can wait for the hand to come in. And I think that's, that's right at beat two. Yeah. So let's do this. I am... I see. So I'm in two four. I didn't go back to one. F so let me just change. Let me just play around with my meters. So I've got four four here. Right. I needed a measure of two four right here. No, I got. One. So let me just fix up my timing. So this is a measure of three four here, not four four. You know, it's funny. I'm not even thinking in terms of bar lines. I'm just thinking in terms of beats of music, right? So I always have to go back afterwards and clean that up. So this here is 3-4. That's just for your own benefit, though, right? Is it Right, yeah. And if I want to make it look like, you know, <laughs> like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Somebody else looks at my, my uh, music. What are you doing there? That's weird, man. This actually works out really well. One, two, three, four, one. Great. So that actually fixed my problem. Right? So this is where his hand is. It comes in right after the downbeat there. So that really helps me out, actually. It's sort of a happy accident. Right? I don't know if I, you, do you understand what I'm talking about. I fixed my time so that it's 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 more accurate. So there's a measure of two four, a measure of three four, and then a me then three measures of four four or twelve beats till this comes in here at this tempo. If I had just left it at two four, it was coming in uh, like on beat two instead of downbeat. Okay, so now I'm going to have to bring my click track back in. So 
So actually, I'm going to move this over here. So what's nice about this is I've got 12 beats from here. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, one. Vincent's face for the first time. All right, so I've got to come up with 12 beats of music here. So I'm going to go back and watch the whole thing down. Uh, I don't want the click to play when I'm listening. I'm watching. All right, so I think that I want to have here. I think I'm going to come in with a regular piano. All right, so I was just on C, so. getting somewhere, right? I don't like the last chord though, so let's let's leave that loose for now and let me take a look at this piano part. Now, I'm a little bit ahead of the beat, which I don't like. So, instead of quantizing it, I'm just going to take everything I played and just slide it back just a tiny bit. So I just adjusted the color of the piano. I could have done that with EQ. It's, it was a little dark for me.
It's like jazz, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, uh, I just want to get that rhythm a little better. Good, and let's do this. Let me take a look at the piano part for a second. So I've got A, C, D, oh, A, C, F, E, A, C, F, E, D. Okay, great. No, I don't like that solo sound. It didn't fit in. I say I can make that decision really quickly. Um, that was too weak. So I'll just go to the full string pizzicato. And this is actually a chamber ensemble. It's not a large string ensemble. I just want to double check that, so I'm going to solo it. Yeah, so I need to just clean up. So my velocities here need to be a little higher. So I'm just listening to how even. That's early, so let's get that on closer there. something see as time goes on you sort of think about things that you could add to places right so right so I just added that choir in that one little spot And maybe this whole thing can come a little bit earlier. Right, so you don't really hear it while this other stuff is going on. And then I could, you know, if I wanted to uh, orchestrate that a little bit. Add a mallet roll. And then, you know, if you really wanted to emphasize that downbeat there, right, what you could do, which is coming in right here, I think, right? Yep. Okay. So let me come a little earlier than this. One, two, three. Whoops. Came in too early and too loud. Oh my goodness, that's horrible. So see, I'm dragging that so that it comes in right at the beginning of that. 
that's fine. And I'm going to drag that velocity down. And also the volume is too loud, even, the, even that. So let me just bring it down here. So like I said, I use MIDI volume for gross adjustments of the volume. And I made it disappear. Good. too loud now. I don't like the sound of that for sure. I want to have something in the mid-range. It's a little weak. I just added, um, this is the fourth chord, it ends up being that. I want to try something here, so I'm going to jump these up an octave. I forgot to turn the sustain pedal off when I stopped playing. So the notes are extending after I played, so let me get rid of that. to my strings I erased my strings let me fix that again why did it not record that
Great. And then I am going to double that up for the first entrance of our legato horn. Let me do my dynamics. Oh, whoops. MIDI merge. More time. Fix that up in here. And what I want to do here is I want there to be a little bit of breath here. And I want that to slide up. Right, but these slides are coming in late, so I need to drag these notes a little bit early. You know, you know what I mean by the, dra the the slides, right? It's the legato intervals that they play. Boo -ah, right? Those intervals, the slide up between the two intervals. Sort of like portamento. Yeah, that's all baked into the samples. Just a little late. see how that sounds with the strings. Okay, so we're going to change our articulation. Just see something here. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever just have a rest on the space before before adding more music? What, what? I'm sorry, what? Did you ever just leave like a gap before coming in with that new rhythm? If, if that's what I felt like doing, sure, why not? Just asking. No, no, ask away, Mark, please. And it may end up that way. Right, so this, I don't want it here. So I've got that. I could play the Rolling Stones. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, okay, 
you. So I'll add a little punctuation. All right, just adding a little punctuation to those rhythms. And let me get them a little tighter. Added some low bass there. Whoop. Here we go. Clean up that dynamic. Ah. Does Pro Tools have something like retrospective record? Uh, yeah, it do it does, and I've never actually learned how to use it. It's a recent uh, edition. And I forget where it is exactly, but I, I, I'm fairly certain that there is something like that in this. Because I remember reading about it when it came out, but I've never used it. So I don't know. I, I'll have to be honest, I don't know how to use it. <laughs> it comes in handy. Like you do that first improvisation, then you just hit the retrospective recording and it has it. Yeah. I tend to take the attitude of like, if it's meant to be, I'll record it. And if not, I'll come up with something better. Love it. Right. Okay, so this is a good time to go back and listen to the whole thing. And let's see how it's developing. There's no uh, film, I'm sorry, my fault. I might go back and redo the whole thing. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Uh, <laughs> anyway, let me continue on and see if I can get through the next bit. Bad 
I'm just going to play around some. Let me do, I gotta get the timing. Two, three, four, one, two. And then, in, so it's one, two, three, four, one, two. Ah, it comes in on the end, right? So let's see what we wanna do here. Okay, so I'm gonna make this a measure of three eight here. And you'll see why in a second. And then I'm going to make... Oh, it might not be. Hmm, interesting. That might not be right. Let me just see. Let's see if that comes in on the downbeat. Yeah, it kind of does. Yeah. Okay, and now I can get back here. And let me just see. I'm going to get my grid down to eighth notes here. And let's see. So I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So I've got eleven beats. He's entering the pub, or this guy's entering the pub here. Actually, Right, so he's actually starting before that. So this brings up an interesting dilemma. Like there's a guy crying there, sort of out of the blue, right? It's sort of almost like a non sequitur. Uh, it doesn't really fit in with the rest of what's going on. You, you understand what I mean? So what do I do about that? I think I'm going to make that part of this and then start the next bit there. So that would make this a measure of 3, 4. Do you understand the choice that I'm making here? Right? This, this guy here, what, it, what is that? Like, in other words, it seems like it doesn't really fit as part of the story. Right? He's in, the, he's in a club somewhere or a pub, and then he's out in the fields, like, you know, doing his landscape painting, and now he's running with his oils, and then there's a guy crying, and then we're in the pub, right? So I'm going to make the guy crying part of this bit and then come in here with the pub. So I want to move this back here. I'm not happy with where I put that. Okay. Oh, plus there's a mistake. Oh my goodness, I made a mistake when I played. Oh, the horrors. I was able to tell that there was a bad note there because of what it looked like here. All right. So... Yes, I'm copying and merge pasting. And I'm going to do try to do something where it's just a little off beat as well. Yeah, okay, cool. Let's copy this and pop that there. Oh, I didn't get it. Really? Okay, let's try it this way.
So I want a little bit more action happening there. And then I'm going to come in there with a little run up. last note on that run up and it's also rushed so let me just slide it Oops, not everything everything else looks good and all right so let me just show you something about doing harp things like that a little programming bit these single notes fine except what I'm going to do is I'm going to stretch hold out this one here and this one here Right. And that there, I want to I want it to be off on the downbeat, but I'm gonna stretch all of these out so it's like almost like a gliss, you know what I mean? Great, and then I wanna fix my velocity. And it's a little sloppy rhythmically, but I'm going to leave it because it's human. All right. So at this point, we're a little bit halfway through, over halfway through. And I, any questions on what I've done so far? We're going to leave it here today. Is that helpful at all? I mean, I've never really done that in front of anybody before. <laughs> I mean, people that live here hear me doing this stuff, all right, but they don't hear me talking about it while I'm doing it. It's a little bit, I have to sort of, it slows me down a little bit because I have to go back and forth between my creative mind and my rational mind. You know what I mean? So when, when my rational mind is, if I'm sitting at the piano and I'm trying to ingest a new fingering for something or scale, I'm being really careful and detailed and I'm paying attention to mechanical things at first until I repeat them often enough that they become internalized in part of me. When I'm writing music, the things I'm telling you and talking about, I'm just doing. So for me to have to talk about it while I'm doing it kind of takes me out of the creative space, you know, and um, it makes it a little bit more cumbersome to write. You know, it's not as much of a flow as I like. So this is the way that I write music. I do not write things, very rarely write things out on paper. I can, I have. Um, I do print out notation after the fact sometimes to have as a guide so I can refer back to themes as I'm scoring a film, bring back stuff, reprise things, and give a continuity to the score. Like in the next bit, I was actually thinking about this. Taking this, which is the harp, right? You can't see the vocal Oh, key. sorry. Thank you. So basically, I copied the harp at the very beginning. And I'm going to go to my short strings. And Right. And then what I have to do this. So like I just I, I actually kind of like that. So look at how low the velocities are. I want to have it be a little bit more energetic. So I'm going to raise those velocities up. 
these first few notes need to be a little more biting. And I want this, now just let me, I'm going to do a couple more things while I've got you here. So I'm going to copy these notes here. And then I am going to go to my Colino track. And I'm going to merge, paste them here. So this is what this is doing. And so let me get rid of this, these notes here. They're confusing the issue. See how they just give a little bite to the strings? Right, so that's layering, that's MIDI orchestration layering things together, and if I wanted to do, um, right, if I, and then what I could do here then is I could take this, so I'm just lassoing these top notes here, and that's happening at, okay, at uh, the second 16th note of bar 13, so I'm copying that, and then I'll go up here. Okay, second note, so then I'm going to go to four horns short. Oh, so it's actually it's a 16th note. Okay, so let me get the grid, and I'll merge paste that there. All right, so let me just think about this for a second. Da, 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 da. I don't need these. Right, so see how I'm orchestrating this? And then maybe what I do here is I would enter the first time, maybe add to something new, right? So I'm back in E minor. And that's too loud, so let me just bring the volume of that down a little. Now it sounds like the NFL, sorry. Uh, Got to get rid of that. Um, I know what I could do. So this is cool too. So I'm going to add um, a oboe line and a flute line. Instead of playing them, I could play them two, two times and that would be uh, probably more authentic, but I'm going to hold the shift key down and I'll record enable that and I've got both of those playing together and I can record the two of those at the same time. Okay, so I like that, except I'm going to edit it, right? So that was like totally one take, right? So let's see. So let me lasso this so I get both of those notes. And I want this to start earlier. And I want to get rid of these notes because I was verbose. And lasso this and just drag this out. So that's still editing both tracks at the same time? I'm editing both tracks, yes, at the same time. Like, for example, uh, Mark, if I wanted to... Right, you see that? I have the brass. I can have the brass in there, and they're all color-coded, and I could do all sorts of editing all in the MIDI editor at the same time. I don't really teach that because it's enough for the students to be able to just, you know, edit one, one line at a time. But I do have both. So, like, for example... See, I, I lifted that up and the other note is right underneath it. And what you can do is you can, if I clicked here uh, like this, I think it is, 
let me just see something here. Right, I can make them be both two different colors, uh, even though they're color coded the same color. If I really wanted to. Okay, so that needs to go until Vincent's pipey thingy happens. Great. And then I would make that into a measure of whatever. Um, I'd have to figure out how many beats that is there and have his pipe come in on the, him smoking the pipe on the downbeat. And save, 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 save. Constantly save. Don't lose your work. All right, so I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to call it a day now. I'm uh, exhausted. <laughs> okay, and I hope this was helpful. Um, you know, this is the way I work. This is the way I would say 95% of all film composers work. I would say that a vast majority of film composers I know don't really have very good keyboard skills. Um and they might not be as fluid at doing this stuff as I am, but I can improvise. And for me, improvising is the quickest way to get things from out there through me. And that's really the, 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 the that's another philosophical discussion about how the amount of resistance that you can alleviate from yourself and allow creativity float from, and I'm serious, this sounds like, you know, new age garbage, but everything is out there and you are a vessel for it. And the, the most, the, the biggest things that you can do to clear your mind and allow the music to just come through you so that when I'm doing that stuff and I'm really in the zone, I'm just the observer. I'm watching myself work. I'm not really working. I'm just watching myself work. I'm like a, another person standing above me just, wow, look what he's doing, right? The creativity is out there. You could study everything, study, 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 internalize it, get it to be so that you don't have to think about it, and, and, and it's out there. When you guys are blowing your jazz solos, if you're thinking, you're not playing. I, you know, and uh, it, people say, hear something in your head and play it. Well, I just, I watched a video um, where Chick Corea was, somebody asked Chick Corea what he's thinking about when he's playing, and he said, I'm not thinking about anything, I'm just being. You know, and he's one of the greatest pianists of the past half century. Um, so, and the guy's 75 and he's still unbelievable. Or maybe he's even older than that. So that's another philosophical debate. But you see, this is the workflow. You don't have to do this. Whatever you can do to get going on this, get going. So I'm going to write up a, a brief and I'll post it up on the... Um, Google Classroom site and Zai um, to Zai, please email me to make sure that I send you one. Are you here today? Let's see. Yes, suiting. I mean, yes. If you could just email me to make sure I send you an email. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, with the with the brief uh, and get started. So get your get your um, spotting notes set up. However you write, it doesn't have to be as sophisticated as mine, but it has to be organized in a way that's going to help your creativity. Okay. Oh, that, oh, that was for everybody. <laughs> you were talking about creating an arc. Do you ever envision the whole arc of the, in this case, the whole minute worth? Yeah, I am. Because right now I see you just like, you're going piece by piece by piece. Did you have something longer in mind? Yeah, but it, it does build, right? I'm going piece by piece by piece, but I'm thinking about the whole thing as I'm writing, right? Like, in other words, on a shorter, on a shorter level, this whole opening, I'm building this up. building, right? To this point here. And then now a new dynamic. A little bit more in depth, bigger.
a little bit more intense. You know, the energy and the harmonic language. And then right here, I might want to bring it down a little bit and then start building it back up again, which is sort of what's going on there. I didn't need to do more work to that section to make it better. But you could see how as I'm working, I don't have to be thinking about that arc. It's in the back of my mind. And I've been doing this long enough where it just happens. You know what I mean? Like, you know, Mark, when you're out playing with Wondrous Stories, you, you, you don't have to think about the dynamics of the music. You've been playing all those songs for so long that you just, it just nat naturally happens. You know, it's a similar, to, similar to this. And do you have an idea when you're doing this, like, kind of where are you going to end, or a little bit, where do you want to go, or you are just building and, and where it, where I think it, it takes it, you the it music? De it depends. It, it's 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 both. You know, it depends upon every. I might. This is what I'm working. This is the way that this is turning out, right? I might have another piece where it, where I have to do something differently, right? Every every piece that you work on is will dictate to you which one of those choices you make or other choices, right? So that's why you have to... You, I, 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 I'm not big on telling people this is the way you do this. The only thing I'm big on telling people to do is sharpen your ax before you cut down the tree. You know, because as I've said many times, and some people might be sick of hearing me say this, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. So if you don't prepare to write a piece of music, that means getting your spotty notes, that means setting up your markers or making a little guide, a little roadmap, and then organizing your session. You're creating too many roadblocks. If you don't do all that stuff before you start writing, you're creating too many roadblocks that will hinder your chances of success. So that's really the only thing I tell, I insist people really think about before they start writing. But as far as how you actually write, that's a personal thing for every one of us. And, but what I will tell you is that your writing technique and your writing skills should be so strong and so flexible <clears throat> that they can shift to the demands of each project. So I'm using a certain harmonic language here, right? much different than um, the FIFA World Cup theme that I wrote, much different than the Special Olympics World Game theme, much different than the music I wrote for the Democratic National Convention. <clears throat> Each one of those projects required a different musical skill set. You know, it's harmonic language, melodic language, orchestral colors. Um, the score I wrote for the ESPN film Pat XO about the late Pat Summit, great women's basketball coach, was all Delta blues with acoustic guitars. That's much different language than this. Your writing skills should be so, so strong that you can make those shifts and keep your individuality while you're doing those shifts, right? So that it's un uniquely you. Does that help you and I? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I like to yak a lot. I've got a lot of opinions about stuff, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so two weeks from today, we will meet. Please get underway. Don't wait. Uh, this will be due. One, two, three, November 4th. Okay, and I'll put that in the brief that I pop up on our um, on our Google Classrooms. Don't wait to start writing until November second. <laughs> start soon, and do a little bit every day, and then go back and and keep a diary. Version one, save as version two, and build on what you're doing. If we have any doubts, can we send you like? So what what we'll do is. At our next class, we'll go. What I what I like to do is uh, we'll continue. Oh, our next class we also have a guest. We have Jeff Rona, uh, composer. He's going to be talking with us for an hour, and you guys can ask questions. I'll send you a link for his website. Um, he's a great guy. He's a great composer, and he's going to talk. I'll 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 interview him. You'll get someone else's perspective besides myself. He's done great work, um, and he came at composing through being a synth programmer and a woodwind player. So he had a different trip than I did. 
But we'll um, get back to our survey. If you've got questions, bring them to the next class bring, and, and s uh, upload your piece to Dropbox so that I can go over it because the questions you have will be benefit and my answers will be beneficial to everybody else most likely. Okay, have a great two weeks and I will catch you then. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, stay safe. Thanks for the good class. Yeah, the review video will be up in a couple days of this class.